because commonly when I'm in these types of setups, people think I'm a pediatrician or a behavioral psychologist, which I am not. Um, but I am one of the very, very few, to my understanding, only uh, practicing architects who has a doctorate specifically in designing for individuals with autism. So it was one of the first, at least. There's um, some growing interest in the field. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But for the moment, we are very few who are looking at this issue, which is a big issue. So I want to kind of preface this whole discussion with something that is a long-standing belief that I've always had, and it's something I always talked about to my students about, which is the fact that I believe in the power of design. And I think it's kind of the untold hero or villain of many spaces and places that we visit and work in. And it's not always, we're not always aware of the impact that the spaces have on how we behave. But if you're an individual with autism, whether or not you can communicate that or whether or not that you're quite aware of it, there's a huge impact of the built environment. Because when you think of it, the built environment really is the primary and major source of sensory, man-made sensory input in our lives. The fact that this room is configured the way it's configured is because a designer made that decision for us. So, so design is deciding the type, the scale, the profile of sensory input that you're getting on a daily basis. And that becomes so key when you're designing for individuals with autism. But as Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility. So I like to teach my students, like to practice myself, this responsible design. So to make sure that you're thinking of all users in a way that's responsible to all of their needs. So I want to do, there. I think there's enough of us in here to do this. I want to do a little quick exercise that um, I'm borrowing from a colleague who runs the Helen Hamlin Center for Design at the Royal College of Arts in London. And they have a great program about designing for autism. So if everyone in the room can just raise their hand for a minute. OK, so if you wear glasses, put your hands down, or if contacts. Um, if you're a hate to do this female, put your, con put your hands down. So we just have Scott, and you wear glasses and contacts, so no one here is male and doesn't wear glasses? Wow, we eliminated really quick. OK, so that means that this diagram applies to no one in this room. Because this is the universal, this is the diagram by a famous modernist called Le Corbusier, who's kind of the grandfather or godfather of modern design and the International School of Architecture, and one of the people that really looked at standardizing ergonomics and anthropometrics and how they relate to design and how we can design more functional spaces. The only problem with this very historically valuable diagram is it only applies to a six foot completely able bodied male figure, which none of us are. So as architects, we are trained to design for this model. And all our standards, guidelines, and codes are based on this model, which we've figured out statistically is non-existent here. Mm -hmm. And it's usually a minority in every group I do this exercise with. So very rarely do you find the six foot, non-glass contact lens wearing, able-bodied, never used a wheelchair or cane or a walker or any other kind of assistive facility or capability. So this is what we're trained to design for when there's a spectrum of 99% of the rest of the population that design isn't geared for. And that becomes even much more of an issue when you think of needs like autism and autism spectrum, other invisible challenges that we can't see and manifest physically. So I think this is a huge um, problem. It's something in my own practice I like to make sure that we're aware of that just like autism is a spectrum, I think design needs to be a spectrum and you need to think of all the users. And like I said, when I talk about this in the architectural world, people think of it as a very small number of people. And why, that's why this little exercise is so very, very helpful. Um, so we're going to be talking about those margins of people outside of this quote unquote normal 
diagram of standards and shapes and sizes. So just a little story, and I've been telling this story a few times this week since I've been here. This whole journey started for me about 15 years ago. I was a new mother. My daughter was about five months when I first went to site to the first school that I was asked to design. I was contacted by friends and family who, of parents who were putting together the first center or school for autism in Cairo and in Egypt, and it was one of the very first in the Middle East. As Patty knows, those things didn't exist <laughs> until very recently. So um, I was asked to design the school. I, at the time, I was working on an outline for my comprehensive doctorate examination in a completely different subject. Funny story, last night I was going through some documents looking for something for today's talk, and I had to open up my PhD folder, which I haven't opened for a long time, and I saw that old folder of that other topic that I'd worked on 16 years ago that I discarded once this project came to me. So I had a very, very brave advisor. I called her up and told her, I mean, I know we've invested a lot of time into this other topic, but I found something that I think is really worthwhile for us to look into. She gave me six weeks, which wasn't a lot of time, to come up, kind of crash course, comprehensive prep, to come up with something and reviewed it and said, OK, I know nothing about the topic, but I'm willing to take a risk and do it. And so we went ahead. We put together a study in the school that we were designing. This group was already in a residential facility, which they were using for their school. And they were moving to another facility and then hopefully designing a bigger facility. So we had an opportunity to pilot and test things. And Scott and I have been talking about doing something similar here to try out our ideas, these hypotheticals that we had from our preliminary observations of the kids in their spaces. And we put up a clinical trial for about a year, where we had a baseline observation for three months of all the classrooms in the school. We were looking at three specific indicators of behavior as uh, guidelines for success or failure of the space. We looked at response time, attention span, and behavioral temperament of the students in the classrooms. And we were doing very specific measurements of time spans and recording all that and collecting the data for the baseline. And then we split the classes into control and study classes and did some interventions in the study classes. The two main interventions we did at the time was a spatial reorganization of the class, which is similar to what we've been discussing all this week with the, all of you. And we also did some acoustical modifications to some of the SLP training rooms, as well as some acoustical modifications in the classrooms. And then we went on to test the control and study um, groups for another six months until the end of the school year. And the results of that became my dissertation and became my published work. And then from then, that kind of field grew with me, and I, it's grown until it brought me here 15 years later. So I'm very thankful to the first school that started me on this path, and the kids there, they're now in their 20s, big young men and women. Um, and then we had an opportunity to design their purpose-built facility, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the result of that first original study, in addition to um, consequent studies in home environments, um, in other school environments, I've designed or come up with and summarized my findings in what Marlene introduced to this aspects index, design index. And it's an acronym for seven criteria. The criteria, the first one is acoustics. And I remember when I was first um, kind of doing exploratory research with parent groups, on what they felt were the most important sensory cues for the built environment for their kids. And getting an email back from one mother here in the United States in New Jersey, and I remember he, it was a long survey that I sent, and I was expecting like tons of information and data, and she wrote back three words, acoustics, acoustics, acoustics. And I've always remembered that and how key and important it was um, to her. So acoustics became the first criteria that we like to look for. And I just want to say that the index it's not prescriptive. It's not like code. It's not like regulation. It's not like ADA guidelines. It doesn't say the room needs to be X by Y by Z. It doesn't give specific numbers, doesn't give specific ranges even for any of these requirements. But it gives a framework. Um, it's what, the, what they call in the British system of special needs design a catalyst for design guideline generation. So it's a framework around which you start thinking about what is the acoustical environment of the space that I'm designing, and how will the students perform within it, and what can I use as data as a reference point to see what works and doesn't work. 
So that's acoustics. Um, there are two things when we come to talk about acoustics. There's like the noise transfer from one place to another, and that relates to the quality of the, the partitioning. But there's also the reverberation and the bounce and the echo that we've talked a lot about this week at school. The second criteria is spatial sequencing. And a lot of times, um, and this, this began as a hypothetical that was just kind of an instinctual feeling for me, because the issue of routine and adherence to routine in the children's everyday lives at school kept coming up in every conversation we were having. And at the time, about 15 years ago, the school of thought was trying to break that routine and have them normalize and be able to be more flexible and not so obsessively attached to, their, to the routine that they were used to. And then one therapist um, who was doing something a little bit different, he said, I actually use the routine. That's something that now a lot of OTs do, for example. They use the love of routine and the love of structure to kind of subliminally sneak in other bits of learning and information along the way. So I said, so why can't we do that in space and design? So why can't we organize the school as a whole, the classroom, the bedroom, the home, in a way that follows that routine that the child or adult feels so comfortable with. And it also came from the idea of a conversation I had with one of the teachers, one of the very early meetings we had where I sat in a room and I had no idea what we were going to do. And I asked them, what can I do to, if you could have like the wish list we've been talking about, if you could have like the perfect world, the perfect request, what would you want um, from your learning experience with your kids? And one teacher said to me, there are these moments where I can connect and there's that clarity, and there's that eye contact or focus enough that I feel that they can really learn. And if I could take those seconds or moments and expand them and make them bigger. And she was just throwing that out thinking that had nothing to do with space or design. But I took that very seriously. So I thought if there's the predictability in the space, so the child is comfortable enough, so you kind of free the space and their understanding and cognition to be able to learn what they need to learn, that would be very helpful. And that became kind of a guiding idea for everything else. So this idea of spatial sequencing goes throughout my work. The third criteria is escape. And um, the idea with escape space is to create a refuge, a place to go to when that sensory environment is just too much and you need to break away from it. And you also need to limit the kind of input that you're being forced to deal with. So as opposed to having to deal with 30 faces and 12 lights and these hanging microphones and everything else that I would imagine be very, very distracting, the pattern on the floor and everything that everyone's wearing, all that stuff, when if you need to pull away and get into a small space for a moment just to readjust and then be able to enter back, that's very helpful. And we've also talked about this a lot. The, the thought may be that that escape could be so tempting to go there and just stay. And that actually was a fear we had when we did in the original study. Because part of the modifications we did was put in an escape space in one of those early classrooms. And I remember convincing the teacher to give it a try. And she was like, I have one girl in my class. If it's there, there's like the bean bags and the sensory stuff that she needs, like her little texture ball or her little music. She's never going to leave. She's going to go in there, and I, I won't get her out. And that's exactly what happened the first couple of days or weeks. But eventually, when the station stayed in place and it wasn't moved around or fooled with like the rest of the classroom was, and she was, the child felt that confident that it was going to be there to stay, she started leaving it more, retreating back into the classroom, and then only going to it when she needed it. And the interesting follow-up, I went back to the school about a year later. That child had moved to another class that was one floor up. And whenever she felt herself building up to a need to break away, she'd sometimes come down, open the door, check to make sure her little space was still there. Wouldn't necessarily use it, but it's still there if I really, really need it. And that helped her to be able to focus and feel comfortable that that support was available should the need arise. So that's the idea with escape. Um, the fourth criteria, compartmentalization. And the idea with that, it kind of builds on spatial sequencing. So if you if you think of taking the narrative of a day for a child with autism in your school or in their home or wherever it else and tell the story of the narrative, OK, I do this first and then I go to that, and try and string those experiences together in a sequence, it's also important to create a little bit of delineation between them. Aaron and I were talking about the problems with multifunctionality, where I'm in a space once to do something really fun, and then I'm in a space another time 
when I'm melting down and feeling agitated and so on, and how confusing that could be. So the idea is kind of a place for everything and everything in its place. So there is a station or a compartment at home or at school where I only do this activity. And I'm conditioned to be prepared to do this activity when I'm there, and I'm expected to. And that helps uh, build on this need for predictability for them, for the person to get back, back on task. And it, and it is a typical skill as well. I mean, Marlene and I were talking about when you're in your office, you're conditioned to do certain things. And if you're required to do something else, you may not be as focused on it because you're not conditioned to do it in the office. And that's how compartmentalization helps. Um, the fifth is transition. So as you're moving through these sequences, because sometimes there are abrupt jumps from one experience to the next. So I'm outside in the playground playing and jumping and flying through the air, and then I have to come in and be quiet and focus and listen and, and communicate. And that's a big um, jump down. So to create and embed within a building or a space that a moment for transition. And it can be as easy as just a bench to sit on quietly, comfortably, in a tucked kind of finite space, a soft space, a safe space for just a few minutes to, to settle myself, transition myself. And again, that's something that's transferable to the typical world. We are giving the example of shopping. They're shopping around and you're like overwhelmed. It's just too much. I need a minute on a bench to kind of adjust or take a break from whatever else I'm doing. So transition is also very important. Sensory zoning is the sixth. And as architects, we are trained or taught to organize buildings with utility and function foremost in our mind. So you think of, for example, a hospital you need, or a hotel. You have back of the house, you have front of the house. You have places where the employees are and places where the public is. You have restaurant spaces that are fun and lively, and you have uh, room spaces that are quieter and, and more subtle. And that's how you zone your building. And in designing for autism, I like to think of it as sensory zoning as opposed to functional zoning. So it's more quiet and loud. It's more active and settled and designing spaces with high stimulus and low stimulus in mind and organizing them along those lines without mixing the two. So not having low stimulus spaces and high stimulus spaces mixed without allowing compartmentalization and transition between them. The final um, criteria, which really should be the most important thing on the list, is safety. And safety comes in all forms. It comes to access to buildings like this, who gets in, and what kind of permission and security they have to go through to get in. It also relates to kids leaving premises. So how do they get out and how do you control um, them eloping and leaving unsafely from somewhere? It also talks about physical safety, like edges and spaces and textures and surfaces that are safe. Um, a parent from the board was telling me yesterday that he routed his sills at home. So he has soft edges on all his sills. So they're not like a sharp edge that his child could hurt himself or herself against, which I thought was a very smart idea. So this idea of making sure that everything is safe and kind of anticipating inner, an injury. And another great suggestion was to bring in like an ER doctor and have them reverse engineer a room and say, oh, I know an injury that happens just like that and then work backwards from there. But to have safety really clear in your mind. So to summarize all of that, the general philosophy is to calm things down, to break them down into manageable pieces, to then sequence them in a way that makes sense to the schedule and the routine of how we want to go about our day, to transition between them, and then to allow for escape any time along those points when you need it. So that's kind of just a general guideline. I'm not the only person who's been um, looking at design for autism. Uh, our work is one of the few who's done kind of evidence-based clinical trials in a setting and looked at the results. But there's a lot, there's a growing number of a handful of work that's out there. Um, so this is a list of some of the things uh, that some of my colleagues are also doing and some of the legislation bodies like the UK's Building Bulletins, which is part of the Department for Educational Services. And there are requirements and recommendations for autism, which are very minimal, that, that's about it. Low stimulus, clear layout, I mean, that's, that's it at the moment. But there are other um, researchers looking at this, perhaps more anecdotally, but it is out there. One really interesting <coughs> research was done by Sten Bombers and Anna Heiligen. I was actually Sten's examiner for his doctoral dissertation, and this was one of the papers 
that uh, came out of that dissertation. And he used what he called autobiographical information. So it's autobiographical data collected from adults with autism to come up with um, his criteria of how to design through the eyes of someone with autism. And it was a very interesting piece of work that we worked on together. So just to summarize that kind of literature in the timeline, so in 2002, we did the first evidence-based research that ultimately led to aspects. <laughs> And in six, Chris Beaver and I both presented at the World, or Chris didn't make it, but we were both submitted papers for the World Autism Organization in South Africa. And I know that ELS also has a foundation in South Africa. So South Africa, from the continental perspective, is very much ahead of other countries in that continent when it comes to special needs and autism particularly, which was good to see. There was also a researcher who looked at what he calls a neurotypical approach. I don't have that example here because I wasn't directly involved with the pro project, but he advocates for almost the exact opposite of what I advocate for, which is neurotypicality in everything. So as much color and stimulation wherever you go, so you're forced to generalize that skill outside. I have some reservations about it, um, but I understand his reservations of my work, uh, but I think it comes from a little bit of a misunderstanding. There, I am not advocating in this for what I call like a greenhouse, where everything is perfect and set to exactly what is best fit for that group's needs now. I'm advocating for choreographing support in a way that gives enough support for skill to be developed and then taking that support away gradually and having a transition from fully supported space to less supported space to less supported space until you get to the point where you're, you're in a typical space that you can move out into a typical job or a typical environment that would work better for you. So that's what I'm advocating for. So again, the aspects is a spectrum as well. It's not one set fixed um, set of rules. Sorry. So um, just as we move on, there's some other research. In 2013, you trademarked aspects, which for us was a was a great step. Um, in 2010, I did some work with uh, an organization in Rotterdam in the Netherlands to design an adult home for, ha for individuals with autism. Uh, and I'll talk about the work that I did in 14 and 15 moving forward. So of all that literature, this is kind of a visual graphic of kind of a literature review that summarizes what all of us are looking for or advocating for. So issues like minimalism, flexibility, so that things can be changed, but at the same time, things have to be clear and specific. So in 2014 and 15, I did a series of aspects assessments for five different projects um, throughout the world of different scales and different ranges. Um, and the structure of that study was I was testing the aspects index as a design assessment tool, much like what we've been doing here at ELS this past week, to see if there was a correlation between how the users perceive the autism friendliness of the building, how the building scored against the aspect index, and how I, as an aspects expert, scored the building and where our scores matched up. And where there was alignment, it was a validation of the fact that the aspects actually does measure excellence in design. So that was the objective of that study. Uh, this first school is Athlin Berkeley Autism Resource Center by Chris Beaver, who is a UK-based architect and one of only two that I know that is really qualified and, and um, practicing in this area in the UK. This is a resource center that was an add-on to an existing public school uh, and it provided various spaces of classrooms and therapy and some social areas as well. It was very connected to outdoor spaces. Um, and Chris talked a lot about the corridor spaces and the lighting, the flow of space as well. And there was a lot of alignment between his work and the aspects. These next two projects are designed by an architectural firm in Australia, based in Australia, called Heed Architects, led by Paul Heed. And this Northern School for Autism both of the schools that they've designed have similar concepts in that they have kind of central space and they have a central core of general services, so like music, art, auditorium, and so on, and then fingers branching out into classroom clusters uh, that would be organized around age groups and skill level and so on and so forth. So this is one of uh, Paul's work 
um, in the Northern School, and this is a bird's eye view of the completed project. And what I like about the school is that sensory space in the middle. They have that free-flowing uh, walking path that we've been talking about, perhaps introducing in our courtyard here, and this clustering of these classrooms in very distinct kind of modules of space that um, make it clear where you are and what you're doing in different parts of the building. Uh, I think they did a successful job with the sensory environment outside in the playground. So the outdoor space, they've integrated it well, and they're using it as a transition space between one activity and another. So as you move from the general hub of music or art and go back to your classroom, you can transition through this sensory space if you need some tactile reinforcement or something to adjust as you move in. They have a trampoline, which I was told yesterday, American Pediatric Association does not allow in schools here in the United States. So I guess in Australia you can get away with it, but not here. Um, so another view of, of the playground uh, and that bicycle track, but that also could be used as a walking track, which one of the parents that I met with uh, thought would be a great idea. This is another one of Paul's schools, the Western Autistic School campus. And this takes his idea, I think, a little bit further of this central cluster and then these fingers of classroom clusters. Uh, and the bird's eye view, you can see the same. And then in this case, most of the, the playground space wraps around the school as opposed to being in the heart of the school. So each of the clusters kind of has their own uh, playground space that they have direct access to. And in this, I like the indoor-outdoor connection without it being too abrupt. Uh, but the internal courtyard space, like the one you have here, I think is better for moments and social interaction opportunities between different groups. Because in this case, only that class cluster uses the playground as opposed to having the opportunity to meet different people from different classes, different age groups, different teachers, practicing how you meet a stranger that you don't know, and, and doing that in a safe kind of controlled environment. These are some shots of the corridor spaces inside in Paul's school and the Western school. And remember, I promised I'd show you the color coding on high alert kind of uh, approach. I think this is a little bit too busy. Uh, <laughs> and I would imagine would be, for both sides of the spectrum, would be a problem, whether it's I'm very hypersensitive and this is too much for me, or I'm very hypersensitive and I just want to follow the patterns all day long. And in both cases, I'm not going to do very well um, when I get into the classroom. But the concept of using color for navigation and wayfinding, I think, is a good one. I think it needs to be used more subtly. And it's one of the suggestions that's been coming up in our talks here. This next school is actually the result of that first study that we did. This was the purpose-built facility for that first um, advanced school in Cairo. Um, and this is we designed from our firm in Progressive Architects that's Cairo-based. And the idea here is to separate, again, high stimulus, so the pool, physio, uh, OT and so on from the low stimulus, which is the classroom spaces, the speech th therapy spaces. It's a multi-story building. It's not a single story building like yours. Um, there was, it's a very dense environment where it was built and there was a lot of program that we needed to fit in a very small area. On campus in, in this building, there's also a residential, small assisted living residential facility that's part of the school, but not part of the campus. So because we didn't want to have that institutional-like feeling. So it's almost like they're neighbors. So this just happens to be an apartment building that's next to the school. So you'd have to circulate out and to the street and walk along the path to come to school and then the same thing. So it isn't like you can go straight from class back home. You still would have to walk a little way. And I thought that separation was important. And the center of the school is a big sensory garden. Part of it we have we had marked out to be a small multifunctional play field for basketball, mini basketball, and so on. But the sensory garden in the middle was an opportunity for students as they transitioned from the more high stimulus areas to the classrooms. They could either go through the sensory garden and have that transition and adjust, or they could go through the corridors and we have these cylindrical kind of stations. And Scott and I were talking about the similar kind of stations you have here at the school of where corridors meet and trying to use them as, um, as nodes to indicate a change in function, a change in direction, a change in sensory kind of level, and so on. There's a central courtyard in the classroom cluster, which climatically helps regulate temperature. It's shaded. It's a nice outdoor space that's contained where all the classrooms can sit and play in a shaded space. Um, so there are opportunities for that kind of transition, again, dispersed throughout the school at different scales um, and at different levels. We're hoping 
uh, with some funding that I've been shortlisted for this summer to take one of the classrooms because they've kind of partially moved into the facility. It's not yet 100%, kind of like the situation here where you're just moving in. Um, and take one of the classrooms and set it up as an aspects classroom and really apply very rigorously all the concepts of the tool and study that against the typical layout that they've been already using and see some uh, results from that. And we're hoping maybe to twin that with a similar project here um, at ELD. I think that would be really great to try and get data from both sides of the world. This last project, I'm trying to leave time for questions, so I might be going a little fast. Um, this last project is the Abu Zabi Center for Autism, designed by Simon Humphreys, who's a wonderful architect. I had the opportunity uh, to meet and work with him a little bit, um, based again in the UK and London. And Simon's uh, brother is on the spectrum. Um, so he very early on informally kind of aligned his understanding of architecture around his brother's needs. And uh, in a context and uh, uh, environment like Abu Zabi, where it is in incredibly, I mean, prohibitively hot most times of the year, where it is humanly impossible to exist outdoors. It was very challenging not to have that institutional lockdown kind of feeling, which you do get in the Gulf because you're inside air conditioned. You have no fresh air probably for your entire stay, as you know. Um, so I think what he did, in addition to doing something to what, similar to what Paul had done with a central hub of a lot of the shared facilities and then clusters of admin and clusters of classroom space with observation rooms and toilet facilities within and so on and so forth. But what I really like about Simon's uh, project is he kind of created what I call a building within a building. So there's like this canopied cube space around it that gives a lot of shade and helps control the environment. Um, and they were thinking of fancy and expensive ways to do a passive cooling system with water flow on the screens and so on and so forth. So those shaded areas in between the pockets wouldn't be as harsh an environment as they would be um, right outside of the school. At the time that I did the assessment, the building was still under construction. So I have to get in touch with him and check in. And maybe Merlin will tell me if you do get to that part of the world um, where it's at at the moment. So the result of that first study, I don't want to bore you with all the numbers, but kind of the conclusion was that um, First of all, all the schools that were selected were selected because they had passed some sort of peer review process of excellence. So they were award-winning projects. They were projects that were recognized by autism facilities as being good practices already. So we knew we were looking at the best of what was available at the time. Uh, so the result was that the Aspects Index was a very reliable tool to assess that kind of design excellence. And it also aligned really well with how the users and the owners and the clients themselves appreciated their own environment. So there was a lot of alignment between that, which um, I think is very rewarding and validating for the tool itself. Part of the survey was also a lot of open-ended, kind of like the focus groups and discussions we've had. And this is a statistical kind of analysis of how frequently certain keywords were being used in those conversations and those narratives that people provided for me. So you can see that things like transitions, natural lighting, partitioning, students were very central, um, reducing distractions, independence, all of these were keywords that came up out of the study of what is important and what seems to work in setting up the classrooms for those kids in those schools. So finally, just to wrap up how I see all of this fitting into what you're doing here and how we can layer on top of the excellence that's already embedded at ELSE and um, I've seen so much of it in the team and the community and the parents and the students in what's been happening in the classrooms in the plans for the future. Uh, Carrie and I had a long conversation or a, a, a dense conversation this morning that was full of a lot of ideas of what's going to happen in the future. I remember a mom once telling me it's almost as if my son's going to disappear when he's 18 and he leaves school. No one is telling me what's going to happen when he leaves. So I think um, what you're doing here with uh, training and vocational training and placement is really excellent for that problem. There is, however, a layer that we can put on top of that excellence that will help make it even more excellent and work, what I think, much better. And a lot of the suggestions that we've come up with together are for the lower school, but also to really perfect the upper school that's going to be built very soon. 
And these are kind of the guiding ideas. The first is building in sensory pockets throughout the school that don't necessarily, that will help reduce the need for a child to get to that point where it's complete meltdown. So at the moment you have, I'm in classroom, or it's too much for me and I need to go to the break room that's outside and be completely contained and I have a complete sensory meltdown. So there's not too much in place right now to allow for little steps in between. So we've been talking about trying to embed better places in the classrooms. There are some in the classrooms, but some of them work better than others. But also to embed throughout the school interim stations for that kind of sensory buildup so you don't need to get there and you can mitigate it earlier on in the process. Um, space and geometry versus acoustics. The, the spaces here are very generous. I know as you move into them, you still hope and wish that they were even bigger, which we always do. But uh, the corridor and the circulation spaces particularly are very generous. I think um, that's a wonderful thing because they're above spec and code for uh, typical, class, uh, typical school corridors for fire safety and so on. So they're bigger than they need to be, which is great because you don't break the flow of different groups of classes moving from different places or visitors moving around the school. The flip side of that, though, is you get a lot of bounce of noise around uh, the corridors and the acoustics. So that's one thing we've been talking about. Another thing is kind of independence as an ultimate goal and trying to build that into wayfinding strategies Oops. around the school, um, using color, using external views, and making it implicit. Also efficiency in design, making sure that all spaces are used to the most efficient way possible and that and compartmentalization helps with that so you don't have a lot of space that's kind of wishy-washy and it's not sure what it actually does and it's kind of just what I call leftover space which I hate and it's a real waste and you really want to utilize every inch of space that you have for something uh, specific and also allowing for a little bit of multifunctionality generally I don't recommend multifunctionality when it comes to designing for ASD because of that a place for everything and everything in its place concept but at the same time, there are spaces that can do more than one thing without compromising that objective. So I think there's room for us to fit in a little bit. And again, I'm just talking about tweaks that are really luxuries to what is already a great facility. Um, and then finally, transitioning and transitioning on two levels. Thinking about as you transition physically from space to space that we talked about, from indoor to outdoor, but also transitioning socially. So what happens as I transition into a job or transition into an adult uh, or a residential facility on my own in independence and how can we build that in to particularly the upper school in a way that helps support some neurotypicality. I've been making up a lot of words this week. Um, <laughs> so things that look like what you would expect to see when you're at a job or in another place that's not this perfectly beautiful manicured choreographed space. So those are some of the kind of big ideas. I have lots of notes on other ideas that I'll be communicating to the foundation and to the school um, in my reporting. But generally, those are kind of the big topics that we saw in aligning with um, the aspects. So I just want to leave it with kind of an optimistic thought of looking forward. Um, I think there's a lot of potential. Um, I think uh, the center here is pioneering many things. And the fact that you're going to be pioneering aspects in the US because it would be the first facility that purposely and with intent incorporated those guidelines into their design, um, that would be a great thing. And to then track that and take a look at it and pilot it and really work towards developing best, best practices that would be kind of the gold standard, as Marlene calls it, for other facilities to follow here in the US and even worldwide. And I hope that my involvement with that doesn't stop here. I, I would love to see this move forward together as we make this more excellent than it already is. Thank you. Questions? Yes. yes. So we have folks here um, that are employers or right. work with young adults to train um, in employment settings and community settings. Um, I'd love for you to expand kind of how we can help bridge these ideas yes. in a contained environment, in a purposeful architectured environment right. to the, you know, an employment setting or a community setting that is what it is, but employers are maybe willing to work with right. us on creating that bridge. I think who are, sorry, so I raise your hand if you're, if you're an employee oriented and <coughs> okay, great. Yeah. First of all, I think it's wonderful that there are uh, businesses and organizations out there that are open to this idea and Carrie and I were talking about 
how it can be really a win-win for both. Um, one of the, the things that you could do very quickly and very easily is allow for that sensory breakaway. So to carve out a space somewhere, uh, preferably as quiet as possible, preferably as private as possible, and have a little bit of support in there. It needs, it doesn't, and it really doesn't need to be big. That's what's great about these sensory breakaway spaces. They actually work better when they're small and contained because the concept is I have to deal with all this all day. So there are moments where all I want to deal with is this. So if I can be given this with whatever sensory help I need, and it could be little kits, they could listen to music or play something on an iPad or, or just sit in a bean bag. And it can be very, very simple and inexpensive to carve out a uh, little space. It needs to be quiet. It needs to be preferably like with a dimmer switch so you can control the light, um, safe as well. Um, and I'm sure from the behavioral side that the center or the foundation will help you on the behavioral other issues of what kind of supports would be put in place. But that's one of the things that you can do very quickly. Another thing is lighting. Uh, and I know particularly like hotels, for example, back of the house lighting a lot of times is fluorescent lighting just because it's the kind of industry standard for certain spaces. Um, and that doesn't help very much. It's both the buzz and the flicker. So these lights are ideal. They're expensive, uh, but maybe Scott can talk about the cost benefit of how easy they are to maintain and how infrequently you'll have to change them that the upfront costs offsets if you're going to have employees that can function better in that kind of space. And just general um, accommodation. I have on our campus, we're, I'm pushing to have uh, an inclusion program for people on um, the spectrum, the, the university campus where I teach. And I had a lot of struggle from professors who weren't willing to accommodate that need. And they were perfectly willing to accommodate our students who were in wheelchairs, and but they weren't willing at all to accommodate anyone with any kind of developmental disorder. And I got so frustrated with one of them one time. I said, because he said more or less, I mean, why doesn't the kid just man up and do what he needs to do? I don't see what the problem is. So I told them, this is exactly like standing on top of a flight of stairs and asking a child in a wheelchair to man up and come up the stairs. That's the exact equivalent in my mind. And you just have to have change, it's a mindset change that this isn't special treatment, it isn't pampering, it is it is what I need, it's my glasses. You can't ask someone to leave their glasses at home and come to work and work efficiently, that's not fair. They need that support, that's all it is. It's just support. It isn't expensive, it won't get in anybody's way. And there are a lot of little things you can do that would be really helpful. And I'm happy to have a longer conversation with any of you about that. So those are just a few quick top of my head ideas. Can you explain a little more about aspects? Is it is it guidelines or is it a checklist like lead that you have to satisfy certain criteria? I've gone back and forth on what to call it. <laughs> Especially when we came to trade market, they asked me, what is it? Is it a toolkit? How can we market it? What is it? So I like to think of it as a design framework. If you're familiar with the UK's building bulletins and how they work, um, they take certain design criteria against certain spaces and at the intersection they say this is a catalyst for discussion. So you've got classroom and acoustics. I'm not going to tell you what to do with the classroom acoustics, but I know that this is a spot where we need to have a conversation as a client, as a user, as a teacher, as a student, and as an architect designing for you. So I find that model relevant to what aspects is with just a little bit more guidance. So it isn't just let's have the conversation, it's let's have the conversation and these are the points that we can talk about. So I think of it more of a framework and a mindset and things that best work together because there are elements there that need to work together. So like the spatial sequencing and the sensory zoning don't work without as well without the transitioning, for example. So some things need to work in, in pairs or, or, or clusters. They just work better. But there's no specifics. It's, it's not, not prescriptive. Like, it's not like not code. Like voices shouldn't bounce off the walls above 50 decibels. There's there's research now being done. I just reviewed a paper. I can't give you too much information about it because it's not published yet. But I just reviewed a paper that is looking prescriptively um, in a more clear way of, OK, so this is the frequency range and this is the reverberation time that is conducive to learning in this environment for this group of students. So it is an emerging field. It's something I'm trying to push forward because uh, you need that. Like facility managers will tell you, OK, so give me a number, give me a spec, give me something that I can deal with. And it's still such a new field. But 
I'm glad to see that that it's moving towards getting more specific. But acoustics is a good example for specificity, but others will never be specific. Yeah, so would you would you compare it to something from like our field with education and learning to how like cast.org has the universal design for learning and they have a framework that has a matrices type of approach mm -hmm. to it where these are the objectives that you want to meet, right. these are the supports and you come to the middle and these right. are the, the suggested best practices that right. make a difference but you individualize those to the group of students that you have but within this framework you need right. to be. Let me pull something up that I had in an earlier presentation and I decided not to put up here because I didn't want to get too teachy on you um, but that was exactly how we originally uh, structured this whole study, that it is a matrix um, <coughs> of things. Let me just get the other presentation. <coughs> so it was a matrix of, of things that generated then, there it is. Codes or yes, not, not <coughs> such specific ones, but that gave you like guidelines, um, <coughs> like I said, catalysts that you could then build on. So this is what the matrix looked like. There were the, the sensory issues that space can address. Space, I mean, I'm, I, I'm sure we can address taste, but it isn't something that we typically think of in design. So auditory, visual, tactile, um, sense of smell and proprioception, and how they map out against, this is a, a structure of analyzing architectural space by Francis Ching. Um, so structure, balance, quality, and dynamics. So you have issues of closure, proportion, scale, orientation, and so on. And so how these map against one another. And all these numbers are guidelines that we generated, and these are the ones that we tested. So actually, this is perfect for like a PhD student waiting to do something with it and, and pick one of these guidelines that we that were still hypotheticals that we propose um, we could look at. And symmetry, for example, is one of the things that hasn't been looked in an evidence-based kind of standing. And architectural research is tricky because in certain areas it is very scientific and in other areas it is very fluid. So um, it, it's difficult to pinpoint and to work with variables and so on. So uh, this matrix helped zero in on those. Eric. All right, so uh, you were talking about that model earlier mm -hmm. that's highly restrictive, but yet so many people follow it. Mm -hmm. You're also talking about how you're one of the few architects that endeavors to design for those with autism or who studies that kind of field. How exactly are you going to move, besides what you're doing right now, how exactly is it going to be to move the architecture culture away from this highly restrictive, uh, ignoring people with autism to like a much more inclusive, valuing autism kind of thing, where instead of like 90 people to 90 percent to 10 percent, it's more like 60 to 40 percent, where the 40 percent are the architects who deal with autism, right, and deal with that kind of stuff. I mean, I, you're reading my mind. I have a meeting that I'm going to in Paris mid-March when I leave here. Um, I'm the representative for Africa on the <coughs> International Union of Architects Architectural Education Commission. So we are the ones who write uh, charters and regulations of what architectural curricula should be. I'm also on the Joint Commission for Education and Practice. So we are also talking to architectural regulation bodies who regulate practice. And one of the things I've been pushing for is to bring issues like this to be required of curricula. So just like students have to learn fire code, they have to learn ADA compliance, they need to be aware that there's a growing number. And what's interesting with ADA compliance, that we're looking at mobility impairment, hearing impairment, and uh, visual impairment, there is a statistic, I can't remember the name of the author just off the top of my head, that the prevalence of those three combined in the United States tripled is still not the prevalence that is predicted for autism. And yet, our code focuses so much on those challenges and isn't even aware of um, challenges like autism and other developmental disorders. And I was telling someone the other day, I have an email earlier on in my research that I sent to the director of the International Building Council to ask him 
are there codes that talk about autism? And I still have that email because I thought it was so abrupt. He said, I do not know, nor do I ever predict that there will be such a code. So I would love to send him an email and maybe give him the link to this. Um, but that is a, an absolute excellent point and, and very, very much needed and something I'm pushing for in education. Practice is a little bit tougher, but if you started in education, then in a generation it filters through to practice and, and you're done. So wish me luck. <laughs> Scott. I have a question for you. I'm trying to generalize this because most of the facilities that you talk about are really trying to design the best educational okay. facilities. Right. But when you started the discussion about trying to move and transition right. to adulthood, in your work, do you think the, the goal is to try to figure out how, as I've worked with a lot of developers as well, how you make typical spaces, mm -hmm. typical workplaces, um, shopping malls, airports, places where you take your kids right. as they get out, not in these special built educational places where they work well and they assimilate to it and it's mm -hmm. all for them, mm -hmm. moving your work forward, how to take those elements, really incorporate them into more typically designed right. places or criteria, what have you, um, to really streamline that into right. a more you know, generalized, uh, common, generalized yeah. area. No, I agree with you. I've done some work on home environments. So, um, and there are two women here in the United States, um, Arzenton and Steele, Kimberly Steele and Sherry or Shelly Arzenton, that have done a lot of similar kind of work giving guidelines for housing developers to help. Uh, but that's again specific purpose built facilities. But in generalization, again, it's ideas like creating breakaway spaces. So imagine if in an airport, just like in some airports, there's like a prayer space or a little chapel or something. Having something similar, a, a sensory break space that someone could go to that, like they have smoking rooms. I don't know they have them in US airports. You don't have, do you have them sometimes? So I mean, we're, we're supporting smokers, which most people agree is not a good idea anyway. Um, and they have a right to smoke, but your kid doesn't have a right to a moment of peace. Right. And that's ironic. And, and if we can carve out the square footage and the cost that it needs to do that glass chamber, we could do it for a little space. So uh, that's one of the things that, but again, how do you get the facilities to buy into that idea? Unless it's required, if it's just best practices, then they'll say, okay, we just don't want to be the best, and that's fine with us. So uh, it's a bigger conversation. I think the UIA can play a really central role. Because of the International Union of Architects, we have representatives from AIA and from the Canadian Institute of Architectural Practice and everyone else from every country, 124 country member states that we have. And that to me is a great mechanism to get this put on their agendas um, to thinking towards making it required of certain public spaces uh, to have that put in place because again if you just look at the numbers you're looking at percentages that are higher than mobility challenges hearing impairments and visual impairments that we put supports in place for yeah I think also now there are um, especially in the state of Florida because we have the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities which is a grant of the Department of Education they're working with businesses that are just typically built and weren't necessarily built for hotels to be specific to autism friendly sites and being able to take information like you're giving and individualize it from an autism specific point of view to have that um, specific business be able to make accommodations to their space that match their needs but also are autism friendly in nature. There's, there's an entire kind of training process for that now in the state of Florida and then other businesses working together if they're interested with the businesses that have already established those practices and been successful. I think that that is a nice way to that you may see some evolution right. in the places that weren't built purposely for those uh, reasons to be able to utilize the resources we have, especially in this state, to at least get closer to um, the point than they are now. I mean, I think the process that I would recommend is if there's a cluster of businesses that are putting together best practices for support, other types of support, to tag onto that a conversation of assessing those spaces against aspects and ha ha identifying the gaps of where work needs can and needs to be done and then see if the money is there, if the availability is there, okay, this is what you need, you should need to do to make this more accessible um, for your employees and for your customers as well. I mean, it's not just your employees, but it's the people that come 
to your facility as customers, whether it's a shopping mall or a movie theater or a hotel, uh, with the, the CDC statistics changing, every time I go to speak, I always have to check what the latest the CDC has said on the prevalence because it, it goes up and up and up every time you check it. So um, with those kind of numbers, and businesses need to start addressing that population. Anyone else? 